Do you guys have any questions or anything you wanted to talk about? Or shall I dig into themes or what is, um, what are you guys thinking? I was really excited about my theme this week. Uh, and I figured I'd just talk about this week and possibly next week as well, just because we haven't been on for so long. Um, this week, I was talking about, I called it balancing your muscles, but really my goal was to talk about opposing muscle groups and how kind of bring people into light about when you're working one side of muscles, what's happening on the other side and how do you keep a balanced body based on, uh, you know, muscle contractions and muscle work. So overdoing only ab work doesn't help you with your balance in your body because if you never do any back extension work, for example, that's I think the easiest example for Pilates instructors to see is if you don't do enough ab work, uh, I'm sorry, if you don't do enough back extensor work to counter the ab work or vice versa, then you're gonna have an imbalance, right? One set of muscles stronger than the other or a set of muscles tighter than the other. So I, I launched it in kind of two ways because I am fortunate enough to have two classes uh, a week that are pretty much the similar ones. So that's my Tuesday and my Thursday mornings. And so Tuesday, I really focused on the big muscle groups. Like my goal was to talk a lot about those, like abs versus back extensors and quads versus hamstrings. So I wanted to give people a sense of how do you get enough work in your quads? How do you get work in your hamstrings? What happens when you are working your hamstrings to your quads? Or what happens to your quads, uh, to your quads when your hamstrings are trying to work? So I talked a lot about how uh, if you're doing a bridge, for example, Right. When you're up in the bridge, your glutes have to fire and the hamstrings have to fire in order to lift you up into that bridge. Right. But what that does is so your leg is bent, though, in a bridge. Right. So here, maybe I should demo as we go. I decided to be in my warm house today instead of out in my little cold studio. So bear with me here. You get a very colorful carpet view. All right. So if I just for sake of argument, just put knees and feet together. And if I come up in my bridge, which you guys all know this really well, right? Trying to lower the belly, trying to squeeze the glutes upward, hamstrings upward, right? So I'm squeezing, lifting, working the backside, but because of the position I'm in here, I have to have enough length in my psoas, my, and mostly in my rectus femoris, right? Because that knee bend puts that rectus femoris on stretch. So primary quad needs to have enough room for me to get in this position, right? If I am so tight in my quad, then I'm not gonna be able to do this with my feet bent so much. I may need to take my feet out and then try it. That takes a lot of pressure off the quad. It allows me more access to the glute and hamstring per se, if I was somebody who was really tight, right? Conversely, if I wanted to stretch the hamstring, I need uh, to activate my quad to make that happen, right? If I want to take a leg up to the sky, I have to have two things. I have to have enough strength in this quad to hold that leg up and strong and straight. I also have to have enough flexibility in the hamstring in this position. Otherwise, one or the other won't happen. I either won't be able to have a straight leg, or I'll have to kind of compensate, right, to have that straight leg. I won't be able to do this if I don't have the length and the hamstring while working this quad in this way. Or you get the lazy knee, right? You all see the lazy knees, lots, lots of lazy knees in class, I'm sure. Right? Try and get people to contract this quad. It's hard because it's hard work for the quad, but it's also fighting the tight, any tightness that somebody might have in their hamstring. Yeah? So go ahead. Sometimes people say, uh, or I often hear that they uh, um, don't get a hamstring stretch if they straighten. Well, we've talked about this actually. They don't get a hamstring stretch if they straighten the leg all the way, right? I guess yes. because they're so tight or it hits the calves first or um, yeah, or the back and the knee. Right, right. So I just wanna introduce Milena just joined us. She's here local 
in Switzerland here in Locarno. So this is our, her first little grouping with us. I was at her studio this morning. She has a beautiful little studio here in the area. So welcome for being part of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, Kim, back to your point. There, somebody who is tight in their hamstring cannot get, right? You, they cannot get that straight knee at, they'll have to take the leg down to get, I should do it on this side. They'll have to take the leg down in order to get a straight leg, which means that now the hamstring is not so much on stretch anymore. So either one or the other for somebody, they, if they try and bring that leg up, keeping the knee straight, probably they're lifting. If they could work enough in that quad and bring the leg up, keeping the spine neutral, they would eventually get that stretch. But it's so much work in my quad. If you try it now, and, and I'm not tight, right? You, you actually, some, Kim, you're a little bit tighter. So maybe on your body, you could feel what they're talking about more if you try it. So if the, right, so why don't you try it? Yeah, Genevieve, you're mobile, like crazy mobile too. But if you have to keep that quad straight and bring the leg far enough, you will get some of a hamstring stretch, hopefully. And the more you straighten and work that quad, the more the hamstring stretch will come on. The problem is a lot of people are not very strong in the end of knee extension. So at the ends of knee extension, there's often not a lot of straight. That final extension. Yeah. yeah. So Kim, so I would I, say- I get yeah. a hamstring, I can get a hamstring stretch with my knee bend as you said, a little bit folded in a little bit more, and then I get a stretch right back here. I straighten mm -hmm. my leg with it back this far. It pulls more on the back of the knee and the calf, and then I point my toes, and it moves down a little bit, but yeah. And I have my quad. I mean, now I just did that first one with my knee bend, and now I have my quad. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Right. So, so the point being, I mean, it's really hard work though. I would think that you feel it's really hard work to keep that knee straight and find that stretch. So I think that's why a lot of people don't quite get it. They don't quite get that stretch with the knee straight unless they're flexible enough or strong enough, right? Center has to be strong enough to hold that neutral spine. Otherwise they're going to curl the tail and there goes your stretch for the hamstring. And then we have had, I, I'm sure a lot of you have had those really challenging clients who just don't understand either the neutral and they don't understand how to get a hamstring stretch. And no matter what you do, they still don't get a hamstring stretch or you finally think you get them in the right position. And then they say they feel it in their calf or the back of their knee only, right? Those people maybe shouldn't be stretching. If, if your goal is hamstring stretch, maybe those people shouldn't be doing it in this way. It's just not, maybe with a strap or with a band then you might be able to get that. The other really interesting thing that happens if, uh, we ha if you do it with a strap or a band and you contract the quad, right? So if I go back or even the hands behind, right? If I go back um, a little bit and I contract the quad, we call that active inhibition of the hamstring. So active contraction here of the quad creates a stretch in the back of the leg, right? So we can use that and then we can actually press into the leg. So exercises where we're doing, you know, our single straight leg stretch, I usually cue it hands at the calf pressing and then this leg pressing back into the hands at first will help me get more length. But if I can press and contract, I can encourage stretch and then when I relax, I get a little more length. Yeah, we, it's called active inhibition. It's a tool that we use a lot in physical therapy to get more length out of a muscle, gently, but you could encourage people to work through that way. And we did, um, so contracting the quad like that could be actually helpful to open up the hamstring. Contract, relax, you could do, we've done those where, I think we did it a few weeks before, the holidays, we had the foot in the strap and we were bending and straightening at different angles, right? First straight up and then thigh, we did it here. 
bend and straighten and bend and straighten, kind of pumping. And then we brought the thigh in and we worked to try and straighten the foot towards the head instead and foot towards the head instead. A lot more challenging. It just changes the location of the stretch sometimes and can get different fibers on stretch a little bit more. So you, if your goal is hamstring stretching, you could use the quad to encourage that. Um, but just keeping in mind that the quad and hamstring are those big opposing muscles, right? So one contracting causes the other to relax or one working causes the other to lengthen. So you want to keep that in mind. If somebody doesn't have enough length, they're not going to be able to contract as well. Yeah. So when I took them through the hamstring quad was one of the big ones. Abs, back extensors was another big one. And then I did the biceps, triceps, because I always, I always have in my head whenever I think about balancing biceps and triceps, those guys who work out a lot and their elbows no longer straighten all the way when they walk around, their arms are always bent, right? Because they overdo biceps and don't do enough triceps or don't stretch the biceps enough for the triceps to lengthen enough so that their arms hang down. So those were my, I did some adductor, abductor, which is also an interesting one that maybe we can talk about because the adductors, when you think of the adductors, we're thinking of pubic bone, right? To medial knee. That's our, our longer adductors, right? Gracilis, um, adductor longus, adductor magnus. So we're thinking of those guys uh, more than like the short pectineus. When we, so we have those adductors obviously working to press inward, easy to feel. What's interesting is, is when you think about who our abductors are, a lot of times we think of pressing in and then pressing out. But what is pressing out? That action. Rotation. It's rotation. It's not abduction, right? Who, who's our abductor? <laughs> Glute medius. <laughs> glute medius. And the action of glute medius, right, is either in stance or uh, sideline, right, abduction in sideline. That is the opposing to the adductor, not hip rotation pressing out, right? Hip rotation pressing out. The, the counter to that would be hip rotation pressing in medial rotation of the hip. Yeah, so you could create that if you wanted to. But then when you think about, right, internal rotation, we don't, I don't use it a lot because I don't find it very functional unless there's somebody who's very bow-legged and could benefit from it or somebody who's very open externally rotated at the hips that needs help with finding neutral and there you could work more internal rotation. I just don't use it a lot because it's, I don't find it very functional, but you could create an internal rotation versus external rotation. But what I find is still structurally so interesting is we talked the length of those adductors is full length down the upper thigh, but the length of the abductors, glute medius is, right, just, just glute medius. And then we have tensor fascia lata, for example, that can help uh, a little bit with abduction, but that's also just this tiny little muscle up here right? So we have tiny short muscle and tiny short muscle, and then we have IT band, which is fascia, right? So I just find it um, an interesting design, an interesting plan idea um, to thinking about when you think about adductors versus abductors. So if you want to know why somebody's IT band is tight, now you know, right? Because it's the only lateral structure on, uh, that goes down the leg. It's, it's only IT band. So it needs to be tight because the only contractile portions are the short, the TFL and a bit of the glute mat, right? Come in and they create those fibers that go down into the IT band. Yeah. So just really interesting to, to picture. I always love to come to the pictures in my head and see what's going on. So the other, the other action of glute medius, you guys know, because I drill it into you, is the hip hike and stand, right? So standing up on the leg is also glute medius. That is the other way to, to counter abduction, actually, is to stand up tall. And so one of my favorites is um, standing with a ball or a pillow. This is one of my 
it's become one of my Zoom favorites, is standing with the ball or pillow high up in the inner thighs, right? So that we have a pressure inward, kind of that wrapped pressure inward. So I've got adductors working and then staying stacked on your leg and floating the other legs so you can see my feet all the way. So can't see my feet because it's not on the ground. Well done. Okay, so now you can see my feet. So wrapping in, pressing in, squeezing in, that's adductors. And then if I want, I can transition to standing on one, just floating the other foot off the ground. Now I've got abductor of this leg working. So I love this because it really helps get adductor, abductor, same leg working at the same time, right? And then you could do little squeezes here, holding if you wanted to, to, to uh, kind of solidify that stance. But it, it actually, whenever I do this, I always feel like I'm connected. And if you remember, the other thing that happens when we go in to inner thigh activity, we get, naturally we get pelvic floor, right? So we get inner thigh connection, pelvic floor lifting, hip pulling inward, floating leg. And now I've got adductor, as long as I keep pressing in, to that pillow and lifting up, I've got adductor, abductor, both working for stance. And ideally, for me, both of those are always working when you're in stance. Yeah, not one more than the other. That would be our ideal world. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, can I ask you a question? Um, for that yes. exercise, are you just um, holding like, um, or are you actually lifting and lowering the, the hip, like hiking the hip I, up and lowering? I mean, I think you could do what you felt like was most necessary. I like to collect to the center and then transition weight to one leg. And then, then that stance leg stays and the other leg can give it pressure in. So okay. this stance leg is constantly working to push the ball inward and hold myself from going hip drop right outward okay. at the same time. So okay. that's, that's, my, that's what I felt like worked best for me and what I've been working with, but I'm sure there you could, if, if somebody's really having a hard time with that hip dropping. So if we did it this way, if that person was having hip drop, right. So if I come here and the, and the person can float the foot, but they keep going that way then my work might be not so much the inner because they haven't got support outer. I'm gonna to have to take this one up, take this glute medius up and in before then I can use the internal pressure from the other side. Otherwise you'll be here doing the work right. That changes my whole torso and my whole everything just changed as I went, right? Rather than up and in and pressing. Yeah, so you might, if you, that's what you're seeing, then, then you might change how you approach it and how, what you're doing so that they are getting up on that leg. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, any other thoughts on those? Um, I, I've been playing a little bit with that, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, having people do start off by doing calf raises with the ball between the thighs. So they have that like internal, you know, um, pressure that they're doing and then coming up onto two uh from two feet um transitioning onto one leg for a balance which is hard for pretty much everybody um but i find that it's really telling when um they check that hip out or something they just immediately fall down um, and you have to keep that constant pressure on the ball that way so I don't know, it's just something that i've been playing with in classes Yeah, I think it's, I think it really does tell a lot. I, I, and I think, you know, we have a population, a lot of those old people, I think, I mean, not even that old in, I have a, quite a few clients in their sixties and early seventies who are really having a challenge with balance. Actually someone who just turned 60, who looks fit and healthy and everything. And the balancing there is so challenging for her because she just can't get the hip in underneath her. 
So I finally, we finally got it last, this week actually, we finally got her to understand where that hip actually has to be in alignment after going through it and through it. And it was with that ball understanding that you have to, the standing leg has to push into the ball, not the floating leg pushing the ball. It's the standing leg that has to push, which is, which is that stability, right? Abductor, adductor, both holding that leg on. And that's, that's our ideal. Yeah. Imagine, imagine somebody, uh, the extreme would be running, right? You want ab, abductor, 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 both have to be on so that when that leg lands and the knee drops, right? Running is hopping, right? Hopping from one foot to the other. When that knee lands, it can't be going like this. If the hip goes like this, the knee goes wrong, totally wrong, ankle wrong, right? We have to be able to keep that alignment on that step of the landing. So they have to be able to hold that and there has to be that balance there for the knee tracking, toe tracking, foot tracking. So it's really a great hike and hiking. It's true with walking too, which is I used running as that example because I think it's easy to picture. Another great way to show it to people and it was a little easier when we were in studio, but is if you have them just on a little block and just jump off the block. And if you could video that, I've done that several times where I'll have them, I'll face them, have them jump down off the block and I'll video them jumping off the block. They have no idea that their knees like knock in and then come straight again. They don't even realize that they're doing that. And so if you have it on video and go, look what's happening. This is why we need to strengthen. This is why we need to fix the alignment of your feet or your hips or your knees or whatever. And then you'd work up to having them hop down off the box, one leg so that they could see. And it doesn't have to be a high thing just to give them something to come down from, but it's super telling as to where they need to work, whether it's hip abductors or hip adductors. And a lot of times, honestly, it's both. But the hip abductor in our older population is the one that I see failing the most in that. And then the knee dropping inward and the foot flattening. That's sort of that pattern with that balance. So the other thing I was telling them about is um, sometimes we're stronger in one set of muscles and I wanted them to be able to recognize where they're stronger or weaker. And I gave them some ideas, just a general, generally people are weaker in the hamstrings than in the quads. They're generally, and generally weaker in the abs than in the back extensors, unless they've been doing a lot of Pilates. And I, I've only ever had one client to this date, I think, that was really literally weak in her back, so weak in her back that her abs were actually getting stronger than her back. And she had some other complications, and I think that was why. But it was really interesting to have a client that was sort of backwards. Most of the time, I'm having to do a lot of abs and some back. But with her, I had to do a lot of back and some abs to get that balance back. Yeah. So then I took that opposing muscle work on Tuesday's class to today's class this morning and went into talking about the synergistic muscles as well and how synergistic muscles can work together or that they can oppose each other. And the biggest example of that, when you think about that, do you guys have a muscle group that comes to mind? Biceps, triceps. I was going to say Biceps. Uh, there you go. Obliques. Biceps, triceps, I would say, are opposing. Okay. Still, biceps, triceps, opposing. But synergistic, exactly. Obliques are, I think, the easiest example of that, right? We do a lot of oblique and rotational work. What happens once we rotate the torso? Well, okay, go back, sorry. When we do an upper ab curl, for example, when we do an upper ab curl, we're activating both sides of the obliques synergistically to create that forward flexion motion, right? We've got that forward flexion, both sides working. When we want to work them as opposing muscles, we end up with rotation or diagonals. Yeah, and that, do you guys remember which set of muscle works in which direction? Internal obliques versus external obliques? If you rotate to the right, the the ones that fire ipsilaterally are, it's the left external, right internal, or is it right? Yes. Yeah. You're right. So the way, the way that I usually teach it, and maybe I said this in your guys' certification was 
Ipsil internal obliques is ipsilateral. So same side. And so if you rotate right, it's the internal obliques taking you right. And it's the external obliques uh, on the other side taking you right. Internal obliques taking you right on the right. If you go to the other side, it's gonna be the internal obliques on the left working. So external on stretch, internal on contraction on this side. And the opposite's gonna happen on the opposite side. Right. right. So working in uh, the diagonals makes them oppose each other. So the internal oblique on the left is opposing the internal oblique on the right. Same rules apply. If, if I'm tight on one side of my abdomen, I'm gonna limit my ability to contract the other side. Yeah? Same rules apply. If I'm weak on one side, it's going to inhibit the stretch on the other side, right? Same thing. Same thing for external obliques. Yeah. So it's um. Just, it was, so we did these. We also did multifidi. So my favorite little that I find the easiest multifidi exercise, which most people don't even recognize that they're what they're doing is this one here, where the feet are going up and down. So it's getting upside multifidus on work here, right here. If you come down here and you want to feel it, you would go hand on your spine and then bring it up just a little bit above the spine to the high side of your muscles. And then you can lift the feet up. You'll feel those muscles kick in under your fingers, right? So this would be multifidus on one side working. And then you could flip and do the, we do the other side too. Uh, so what is the function of multifidus? So where does multifidus function the most to help us the most functionally in functional movement? Definitely not on sideline. That was just to get us the muscles on, but where do we find multifidus working? Do you guys know the most of us? Standing, but... Yeah, standing and walking, right? Yeah. So one leg, sagittal plane motion, one leg in front of the other. So lunges, walking. So we did a bunch of lunges today in class too. I didn't call it out as multifidus doing work because I thought that would be too much for them to figure out in their brain, but that's what I was doing. So I had them doing just standing lunges, trying to find uh, that connection in, in the back as well. So working in one side versus the other side as we're going. And that multifidus I find kicks on the most when you're pushing off. So the back leg pushing off, that's where you're gonna feel it in gait the most, is finding it from here, right? As I push off, that's where I'm feeling my multifidus kick in to allow that motion forward and allow me to get to the next side. And then it's gonna be my opposing side going through the motion of gait here, yeah? So, finding that that would be uh, synergistically, they work as what? Back, back, well, they're back and they're long, a little bit diagonal, but still long. And in the back on each side, what are they gonna do for us? Extend. Yeah, they're gonna help with extension. So working synergistically, multifidi, all those muscles along the spine are gonna help with extension. Some are more diagonal than others, right? The rectus spinae, the spinalis, lum, lumbar, the lumbar, the thoracic, the cervical spinalis, those are more um, erect, the erector spinae, right? More straight. Multifidus have a bit of an angle to them. So they're a little more angled. So they have a little more of that diagonal function to, that allows us that walking motion to fire more than the others. But they will still, as uh, because their fibers are kind of like this, they'll still help with that extension. So they're still working synergistically, gonna help you with back extension. L and more in the lumbar spine, although, because they're bigger in the lumbar spine, although they go up quite a ways too. So that was my other example of the synergistic muscles. And then we did um, a lot of side work today. So these just side sit-ups, working obliques on the top side, along with paraspinals working together to create that side bend motion, trying to get them to feel that now we can use one side of the body front and back to work together to go up and then the same on the other side. Uh, so 
I think that was pretty much it for what we covered today. And then we started working on, I went back to um, the other thing that I'd love to work on is the plank idea and how the bridge is your upside down plank. So we did that, we did the bridge. And I was talking about how gravity here in this position is working from the top down. So working against my abdominal or against this way. So having to work underneath it to push up. But if I take this position and my arms up, shoulders down, and now, so this would be my upside down plank. And if I can take this position and I coxies curled up and down to get here, right now go down, flip it over and coccyx curl to get here. I have this scene. I can flex my feet if I wanted to really recreate it, but I have the same position only with gravity on the other side. So now I'm challenging the muscles underneath again, which now become my abs and my uh, underside against gravity and still working together as a whole, but now with more challenge on one side than the other. So that was sort of the bring it together, that and then squats. Um, and then the Pilates push up because I had to do that too. <laughs> so that, that was kind of how I put that theme together. I don't know if you guys have comments or ideas or anything, questions. And did you publish them or did you put them out there or did they go out? So, okay, so, so I didn't publish them and that's intentional because I had a lot of internet issues this week. I don't know why but I left them there so that you guys could go in and look at them if you want to. But I didn't publish them because you will have to fast forward. Um, the, on Tuesday's class, there was a long gap. And on today's class, it went out and in like three times, unfortunately, short gaps, but out and in like three times. So I, I'll look at today's and see if it's worthy of being published. I tried to pause the recording at one point to see if I could get it to come back and not have this big gap in the middle. Um, but I don't know, we were doing great just before the holidays and now this week has been a total disaster with me and my internet. But they're there um, and if you, um, Milena or Allison want access to it, I can forward you the link uh, to see what those classes look like. And then you can just fast forward through the little internet lapses uh, if you wanted to. I just didn't wanna general public them because I felt like they were unworthy. <laughs> so just send me an email, let me know and I can send you a private link and you can go look at them. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, did you, so if you guys don't have questions, the theme going forward, we could go on to the next theme for what I'm going to do next week. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So next week, what I, wanted to do was go back to it's uh i'm calling it building to your squat so building up to a deep squat uh, and the reason why i think squats are so important i think all of you know i probably don't have to tell you but is because it's so functional right how do people get up out of a chair uh, how do they get up off the floor how do they squat down to pick something up off the floor especially People who have back issues, right? We don't want them bending forward to get to the floor. We want them bending their knees to get to the floor. And also it's the research is showing that it's a great predictor of longevity. If someone can squat to the floor and back up, then it's a great predictor of longevity. So uh, there are some interesting articles. I should look them up and send you guys the links. They're really, I mean, it's, I think really astonishing um, the research that's been done that just shows how much that and being able to lie down on the floor and get all the way back up to standing. I think we've done that together before without pushing off with your hands and how that's like, if you have to use one hand, it takes years off your life. If you don't have to use any hands, you add years to your life. You know, it just is such a good predictor of longevity. So I figured starting out the new year, we should really get people to be able to squat and to understand why that's an important exercise for them. Uh, mostly because as people age, they need to be able to get up off any surface that they get down to, or if they happen to fall on the ground, they need to be able to get up somehow. So um, the idea is obviously when you think about, well, here, when you think about a squat, what muscle groups come to mind? 
Exactly. Quads, glutes, hamstrings, inner thighs, even. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then even, what else? Even, even abs. Even abs. And that, right, I agree entirely, especially if we're talking about coming up from here. If there's no strength in the abs, how are they going to get up in the first place from here, right? You have to at least be able to have enough strength to go from here to here, right? So that, um, can be a lot of abs. What is something other than strength that we need to consider? Well, I would say mobility, flexibility. Yeah, it's enough like flexibility. In, and even in the back. And... Yeah, yeah. So try getting up off the floor or try right now sitting down on the floor and getting up again. Without trying not to think about it too much and, and try doing it. I have to lay down and then get up. You don't have to lay down. No, you don't have to lay down. Alice, I mean, down. awareness is awareness. What's that, Lisa? Are you talking? Yeah, no, yeah, just like, kind of like a balance, like your spatial. You kind of have to have like the balance, the, the head. No. Yes. Your your neural your neural, your brain your brain has to kind of that neural. You have to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to have. Uh, right, you have to have. Well, you have to have the brain neural activity. You have to have the planning activity, the plan right. ability to plan, to get that. It's a combined motion. Getting up off the floor is a combined, really a combined motion. Right, there's so many pieces to it that you. Uh, have to have the ability to give your body the steps to go through to get there. Yeah, and balance is the other thing you mentioned, Lisa, which we didn't mention yet either. You have to have enough balance to get up off the floor, right? So guess what we'll work on next week? (laughs) Balance. Balance, quads, glutes, right? And planning for steps, so multiple action steps. So... Having them work on things like, how do you get down to the floor? Like, what if I don't want to bend my back and I want to get down onto the floor or I want to get up from the floor? What is a great actual Pilates exercise that they can learn that from? It's a full version of something that we don't always use. plank right there you go Genevieve that that's it the full Pilates plank yeah yes so and okay so let's because we're so in back safe mode what would be the Pilates plank in a back safe mode right what if okay here we are (laughs) back to, to this week's theme right what are our limiting factors for if I need to come down and keep neutral spine let me move away a little bit more if I need to come down and keep neutral spine, what must I have in order to keep neutral spine here? Enough Enough. Exactly. Enough flexibility in my hamstring and at the same time, enough strength in my back extensors to hold this position. This is, this is work. Yeah, to hold this. I'm mobile, so I just want to collapse. It'd be so much easier for me to just let go. I have to work a lot in my back extensors to counter that mobility to keep that neutral. So if we're talking about that back safe population, they could come to this position or however far, say that they're not that flexible because most probably aren't, right? Genevieve is doing it. Then we could teach them to bend to here, right? So this right here, even with pressure on the thighs is a great exercise. Down and up, just that piece of it, down, and up. And then, you know, for your more advanced people, you can have them go, then bend, keeping that neutral, find the floor, walk it out, find the plank. Right? Plank's always one of my favorites. It was so many things. And then reversing exactly, Genevieve's doing it. Reversing up could be bent knees, spine neutral, keep spine neutral, straighten up as one. Right? So that seeing that image should now give you a lot of ideas. Right, Kim, that's exactly it. 
So there's a lot of flexibility needed and a lot of strength needed. So now start thinking about, if you start thinking about all the things you need to be able to do in order to get up from the floor or to squat to the floor, right? We've got so many pieces. Um, the other piece that we didn't talk about that maybe I think Milena will appreciate is what feet have to be flexible enough, right? So mm -hmm. I have to be able to either bend at my toes enough to get that foot underneath me, right? Or I have to be flexible enough to sit here with my heels down. Turned out or not, we're not that concerned when it comes to just getting, when we're just talking about getting up off the floor, but we have to be able to get ourselves from here up. So that's knee flexibility, ankle flexibility, right? Toe foot flexibility has to all be there too. It's really hard for clients who cannot no longer bend at the metatarsals in their toes to get up from the floor. How do you do that then? It has to be what Kim's doing, right? Or what Genevieve's doing, that squat, instead of this way, right? You can't do this. You could do, and I've had people do the back of the foot down and try and push through that back leg a little bit and come up, but that's hard too. Because then you have to have enough ankle flexibility or top of the foot flexibility and strength there, yeah? So working up to a deep squat could be any or all those pieces. Yeah, I love that turned out inner thigh um, that Genevieve's doing, uh, turning down, right? And if we, and then depending on the level of the person, so pretending that we're not talking about our 70 year old who has difficulty, we're talk, what if we're talking about a 40 year old runner, right? Then I put in the little description, deep squat, not enough for you. How about a one-legged squat? Oh, <laughs> how many people can do a one-legged squat? I really want to do a one-legged squat. I want to be one of those cool um, parkour people who can just stand on a, on a pole like that and then without even any weight on this foot, stand their way all the way up. I can't do it. <laughs> I want to be cool like that. What's that? Can you go down on one leg too? <laughs> almost. I'm working on that one. I can, I can almost, I can almost do it. I can do it down, but I can't get back up once I'm down. <laughs> so I have a quick question about having people get up off the floor without using their hands. Yes. Um, if, uh, would you, or how would you do that with, um, someone who has a bad knee? Yeah, I have a lot of knee replacement people and people who need a knee replacement and haven't done it yet. And we do a lot of uh, work where we're babying the knee. So would you even try that? Or are there other ways for them to, to get up, which would not require a lot of pressure on the knee? Yeah, that's a great question. So what my advice to people who are struggling is when, I, when we're talking about getting up off the floor, is I have several goals. One is that they have the plan in mind. So I need to find a plan and steps, so one step after the other. So that just gets ingrained. So you know, if there is a traumatic incident where they fall down, they have steps to get up. Um, and maybe for somebody who has knee stuff, you're not gonna repeat the action a hundred times because that's gonna aggravate, especially people who haven't had the replacement, they're just gonna get aggravated. But one great thing to do is they need to be able to crawl. If, if somebody falls in the center of a room and they can crawl to the side, to a wall, to a couch, to a table, then you can have them working on getting up using that. So if I turn here and if I go down in the middle of the room and I can get myself, so sometimes even getting this hip off the ground is really hard because their knees don't bend that much they're not very comfortable. How do you even get to all fours? But they could either scoot or they can go over and then try and crawl a little bit to get to a piece of furniture, a big heavy piece of furniture. Then I know that there's pressure on the knee, but somebody who needs a knee replacement, this is not so troublesome usually. 
to have some pressure. And people who've had a knee replacement can still put some pressure on the knee. It's not where you want them to be for exercising permanently, but it's okay usually. Right, it just won't be doing the deep squats. Right, the deep squats, right, with uh, somebody who needs that knee replacement, instead of a deep squat, have maybe getting up and down from a chair. So this is also a squat, right? This Mm -hmm. and down is also our squat. And sometimes I have them try and tap and come right back. That's hard work. (laughs) And then you could do it parallel with ball for adductor, or you could do it turned out. And then you could be working a squat in a limited range. Okay. Or you could be working squat with the back against the wall. And the reason that works well is because if I go back against the wall, I can take my feet far out in front. So I have a bigger angle and then I can really activate posterior and I don't get that anterior translation of the femur into the kneecap or down into the tibia so much as if I would, if I am here, here, I get a lot of anterior translation, a lot of compression, but if my heel can be out here as it would, as I can do in a wall squat and push my hips back, then I get a lot less. So this would be a great place to start working also on on that deeper squat. Yeah, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts on squatting or growing to getting to be able to squat more? It takes a lot of strength to squat. Uh, so it would be a build up over time, likely, uh, that you would need to incorporate a nice build up over time. But keeping in mind, if, if you get to see somebody once a week or twice a week even, that that is something you could just work on gradually over time, um, they will be healthier and happier for it. And you're adding years to their life, hopefully. <laughs> too, by giving them that ability to get up off the floor. Yeah. Questions, thoughts, anything? Well, that's pretty much what I had in store. (laughs) I haven't totally constructed next week's classes. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, no, I was just gonna say, because doing all the, teaching all the math classes, even I myself have gotten stronger in squats when Eight months ago, I, would, I hated squats. Now I love them. So, trying to get my yeah. clients to think the same way. Yeah. I think something that really helps that I've, I wasn't as good at teaching before, I don't think either. And I've allowed more of it. Maybe you guys have other ideas is I really cue the hip hinge back now in the free squat. Before I really didn't use a lot of free squats. But while teaching on Zoom, I used to use the ones against the wall a lot more just because I didn't have to worry so much. I could just put somebody's back against the wall. They could dig their heels in. I could keep more than 90 degrees or more at the knee thigh, at the lower leg thigh bend. And I didn't have to really think about what was happening at the knee. But when you're in the middle of a mat class in the middle of a room on Zoom, you're not likely to go find a wall to, to squat against. So I started doing a lot more of the squats that we were just talking about. So let me move this again away from the couch. So I started doing a lot more of the squats. And then at first I was like, how do I get people to not translate forward here? This is gonna aggravate over time. And you can see that forward shear into the, from the thigh into the kneecap, right? Over time, this is not where we wanna be repetitively going. Sorry, little visitor. Um, we want to hip hinge backward. So I've been cueing this back and almost uh, some of the time cueing the toes up so that I really get them hip hinged back. And now I can feel the butt hamstring. The hard part is what then do you do about the torso, right? We, I don't really want people down here trying to hip hinge back. And it's a ton of work I find to keep the back body up but I sometimes cue the arms back or open to try and get that, but really trying to get that hip hinge back helps me find that posterior and not just the all quad in that squat. But I don't know if you guys have ideas or things that have worked 
for you on a free squat? Well, I've been trying to do that a little bit too because of um, encouraging people to be able to, so they can pick things up off the floor. So even in the classes, I let them bring their legs far apart because I have to anyway. So to come down, to stay in that mm -hmm. spine, and then actually even push the butt back more to see if they can touch the floor without grounding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, and yeah. Then, yeah, and yeah, I have them hold the ball that just with something light, touch the floor, come up. So I kind of have to hinge a little more once they get lower to be able to touch the floor without grounding. Mm -hmm. If you're tight. Yeah. Yeah, I think it might be one of those places where you want to choose your battle. Do you let it, the spine being in neutral is great. Do you let the spine be in neutral and not worry too much about where it goes? Like if your chest goes onto the thighs as they're doing it so that you get the right hip position? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah I don't worry too much about that at this point. The idea mm -hmm. is to be able to pick something up off the Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, yeah, speaking of the other one that maybe we could incorporate into this same theme would be the um, seesaw, right? The, which we don't have the springboard to do it with, but you know what I'm saying, right? This, this one where we are pulling down and up and even doing it squatting down and coming up, squatting down and coming up. So keeping that body neutral. There you go, yeah. Single leg squat. <laughs> There's the single leg squat. I found it. I'm gonna make everybody work on single leg squatting to have that. But, and there's a lot in that, right? Alignment, foot alignment, knee alignment, hip alignment, back alignment, length. We could spend the whole class on that. And that's actually out of, again, the Pilates push-up, the arabesque version. Yeah, so if you wanted to steal that piece of it, that would be a nice, a nice one. This is one of my new little friends. <laughs> that was Emmett. <laughs> Emmett? Uh, Emmett, yes. We have Emmett and Grover. Oh, okay. <laughs> I saw a street pass a little bit ago. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, well, lots to think about, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, maybe we can, maybe we can, in the first part of next week, circle back uh, again and see if you guys have implemented any of the squatting, if you've, what you've found works, or the squatting or getting up and down off the floor for next week. See if you've got any new great ideas about it or other thoughts. Um, I think leading up going with this, like the abductor, abductor, abductors have to work a lot. Uh, glute medius has to work a lot, glute max. So hopefully we're preparing them along the way to get there. So hopefully it won't be a total shock when we come to squat. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we'll circle back and see what your experience was if you use any of it. And then we can um, go forward with the next <laughs> after that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Zayn. Right. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. So good to see you all. Yeah.